Thank you. Uh, my name is Philip Gass. I'm uh, with the International Institute for Sustainable Development. And uh, I'm going to look at things uh, from a bit of a sustainability uh, perspective in terms of where we're at in terms of energy and, and where we're going. Uh, so a bit of a different perspective from what we've heard so far. The first thing that, that I wanted to talk about a little bit is where we're at in terms of the energy picture right now, uh, really globally. And that's where where this slide comes from. And where, what we're at is we're at the end of the coal area, era. And it's quite substantial when you think about it that we've used this energy source for decades and, and centuries to, to, to be a, a main source of electricity, a main source of heat for us. But moving forward that we're really at a turning point that that will no longer be the case. The two papers I've posted are, are two things that we've worked on at ISD. The one on the left uh, there with the smokestacks is a comparison of the coal regulations in Canada and the US. Both countries have uh, made substantial regulatory moves to move away from coal for electricity, essentially saying that uh, from a climate change standpoint, the emissions are so intensive that uh, we have to move this electricity out of the grid. And so what new regulations will do will say that any coal that is developed for, for heat for electricity has to meet an emission standard of no less than a combined cycle natural gas. And so natural gas has a, ver a much lower emissions profile than coal. And so basically what it says is that uh, you'll have to move that coal out of the system and able to, to e you'll either have to build coal with carbon capture or you'll have to build something else, whether it's natural gas or whether it's uh, renewables in the form of uh, hydro or geothermal or solar or something like that. This other one uh, was the other kind of major turning point. If the first turning point was these regulations to remove coal from the system, the recent agreement, and you may have heard of it, between the United States and China in terms of, uh, in terms of climate change is the second kind of uh, anchor in terms of the end of the coal era. And what it does there is that the United States is committed to a target of, I believe, minus 26% below 2005 levels by 2025. And in, in in return, China has uh, committed to peak its overall greenhouse gas emissions by, 20, by no later than 2030. This is really substantial as well because really the only way that the U.S. can meet its emissions target going forward is by taking coal out of the system. The target that they've committed to for the upcoming climate change conference in Peru and next year in, in Paris is based on the end of coal for electricity in the United States. And just like that, uh, China as well, uh, without, if they are to peak their emissions, the only way they can do it is by moving coal out of their system. So kind of the first major point was just really that we're at a fundamental turning point in terms of energy in North America. This is just a list of the power plants that are expected to close as a result of EPA regulation. Every one of those black dots is a power plant that will be going offline sometime between now and approximately 2040 which is really, really substantive. And so the question then becomes, well, where do they get this energy from? Generally, we recognize that renewable energy isn't ready to step in. It's not ready. Wind power and solar and, and hydroelectricity and geothermal are certainly going to be a big part of replacing coal over the long term. But it's not ready right now. And so you know, how do we, how do, how do we replace all of the energy generated by each one of these black dots. This here is just a picture of kind of the North American electricity grid. And I, I have it up there for a couple of reasons. Number one, you can clearly, if you, we go back and we look at all these dots, and then we go this way, and we can see that everything is connected. And you see, for example, uh, uh, Jeffrey was talking about it with Manitoba's grid feeding into that, uh, into Minnesota and Wisconsin. BC feeding into the west coast, and Quebec in particular with strong hydroelectric resources feeding into the New England grid, you can see that a lot of those dots are, are concentrated within those grids. And so one of the key things for Manitoba, if we're to bring this back to a Manitoba energy standpoint, is ensuring that if we're going to be selling this hydroelectric power, and the U.S. is going to be moving away from coal power, that Manitoba is, is, uh, is properly uh, positioned to, uh, to pick up some of that slack. It's not just an economic standpoint. We're going to really need to meet these energy needs, and it's going to take a bit of an all-hands-on-deck approach. So hydro will clearly be a part of it. Renewable energies are going to be a part of it. And in the, in the near to midterm, natural gas, frankly, is going to be a part of it as well. Natural gas is still a fossil fuel, but it's, uh, it has become uh, fairly cheap to produce in the US and has a much lower emissions profile. So while it's not an ideal fuel, I think we 
we as ISD recognize that there are going to have to be bridging fuels in place to help get us from, from coal to natural gas to eventually renewables. And those renewables are coming along. The costs of wind power are going down. The cost of solar power in, uh, in particular has gone down quite substantially over the past 10 years to the point where it's uh, now becoming much more economically viable. Over the longer term, we want to move completely to these renewable energy sources, but in the medium term, we consider natural gas as a bridging fuel. And you could argue, um, for example, for nuclear power as a bridging fuel as well. It's not an ideal fuel. There's certainly down, uh, downsides to it, but uh, it gets us from the point we're at now where we have to move away from this very highly emissions intensive fuel to where we need to be, which is clean fuels and, uh, and eventually trying to keep us within the two degree target for uh, global climate change, which is driven by our current emissions portfolio. This, uh, my, uh, my uh, graph here isn't coming through, but uh, the next issue I wanted to, t to talk about, and uh, I'll just have to kind of, you'll just have to take my word for it, I guess, but uh, is the issue of energy transport. And uh, we talk about the pipeline. Everybody talks about Keystone Pipeline, and what it will mean and what it will mean in terms of fossil fuels. My general position is that the energy transport issue is a bit of a red herring in that energy finds a way. And what this is supposed to show is the increase in energy transport by rail from 2003 to 2012. In 2003, roughly $739 million worth of fuels and chemicals, fossil fuels uh, being the primary, uh, primary uh, primary commodity were transported by rail. So $739 million in 2003. In 2012, that's now climbed to $1.1 billion. So while we talk about Keystone, and we talk about we, ha we have to stop the pipeline, to me it's, it's a bit of a red herring issue because energy finds a way. So if we stop the Keystone pipeline, we've clearly seen that while we've been haggling about this pipeline, the transport of fossil fuels by rail has gone from $700 million a year in Canada to $1.1 billion. So energy finds a way. So what's the longer term solution? Rather than focusing on shutting down the pipeline and uh, attempting to, and, and, and looking at stopping fossil fuels that way, it really comes down to looking long term, how do we ensure that we're transitioning to more efficient fuels? Rather than focusing on the transport of those fuels, let's focus on the source of those fuels. So how do we get there? We've talked about the fact that renewables aren't ready to go. Well, one of the, the, the clearest ways to transition from fossil fuels to renewables is carbon pricing. Right now, Canada is actually in a fairly unique position globally, and a lot of folks look to Canada because we have a carbon tax in British Columbia. We have emissions trading in Quebec, and I, I personally believe very soon we'll have emissions trading in Ontario. We've got a coal tax in Manitoba. And we've got a hybrid sort of system in Alberta where it's not a tax, it's not a trading system, but, uh, but companies are forced to offset their emissions by paying into a technology fund which is then dedicated to renewable energy. Each one of these systems is ultimately designed to reduce emissions and meet global climate change, but if designed properly, they can also be a major driver of, removing, of moving to the type of renewable energy we want to see. So rather than focusing on, on you know, the transport of energy and how do we stop uh, oil sands, oil from, from going to the US or going to China or anything like that, from my position, I think we have to recognize that some of these, some of these developments are going to go ahead. Uh, we're going to need natural gas in the short term. But properly pricing the emissions from those energy sources and reinvesting them into the renewable energy that is our long-term solution is really the way that we're going to foster this transition. We've reached the end of the coal era, which, which was based on emissions targets from countries like the United States and China, and on regulations to, to move these uh, systems out of the grid, and on carbon pricing to move these systems out of the grid. So we've moved past coal, and over the long term, we can use these same sorts of systems with higher prices and more stringent targets to be able to move to the type of renewable energy that over the long term is the only real solution for us to address the issues of climate change and energy. So, thank you.